Thank you, Lord, that we can just come to you today. And Father, that we can just lay every burden, every care at your feet. And that we can find rest in your word. And we can just fix our eyes upon the author and finish of our faith, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. People come together and strangest neighbors of what is one. The children of generations of every nation of kingdom come so don't let your heart be in trouble hold your head up I don't feel no evil fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you take courage hold on be strong Remember where our help comes from. Oh, 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 oh,
Our redemption, our salvation is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven, from forever His kingdom come. Our hearts will cry. 
in our lives. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lives. So we pour out A very good morning to you all. We greet you in the beautiful name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah. And um, yeah, we miss you here in church. Uh, we miss to see your faces and we're looking forward to the time that we can assemble again. But we sent this word to you for consolation and for comfort. And we know that God's love is with you. Um, I feel on my heart to greet you this morning with the priestly blessing from number six that reads in the Amplified, the Lord bless you and watch God and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and enlighten you and be gracious and kind to you. The Lord lift up his approving countenance upon you and give you peace, that is, tranquility of heart and life continually. Today I want to uh, share with you a few familiar scriptures. Uh, familiar scriptures because I think I need a bit of that comfort today as well. You know, that comfort, how it is when you slip into pajamas after a long day of work or the welcome of a warm bath or the comfort of your own bed. Um, those scriptures that just enfold our hearts and just um, comfort us like homecoming. We had a we had a intense week this week, and um, I just want to share with you from our heart today. It's more of a heart to heart talk than a teaching in itself. Uh, we had a wonderful women's retreat last weekend. It was again really a significant retreat where we are thankful that God transformed the hearts and the minds of women and he ministered so tenderly to them. Uh, but it was also an intense weekend for me personally because on Friday night we did get um, news that one of our friends that we so dearly love have passed on and we have been st standing with them in prayer for her healing from cancer for probably the most of the last three years. And so it was a difficult um, message for us to receive. And I must say it was quite, quite an intense um, journey for us this last week. But uh, I feel today to, to just stand and reflect on the last week and just stand still a bit at this moment because there's so many of us that are losing loved ones or know of someone that is losing a loved one. And also oh, uh, for us or for some of us a very real battle um, for our health and for the healing of others over this time. And our church prayer group also, our church prayer group is um, receiving many, many requests that flood in for people 
that is in need of healing and people that is fighting for their lives at this point in time. And I want to share with you just a few meditations and the reflections of my heart, especially also in light of Joshua's um, word last week, the power of God's word and his prevailing power in the midst of all circumstance. And it is so that sometimes when we go through these intense times, there are questions that pop up in our heart. Questions that we don't always verbally express, but that is in the secret places of our hearts. And they are sighs of us not always understanding and sometimes seemingly at the loss of words of what to say or how to comfort or the avoidance of eye contact because yeah, we just don't know. We just don't know what to say and how to say it. And some of these questions are difficult questions. It's questions that speak to the very essence of our hearts. It's questions like, why do not all people that we pray for heal? And why do loved ones have to die? Why does bad things happen to good people? What if I received prophetic word, or we received prophetic words that seemingly did not come to pass. And how do we deal with these kind of what we feel is disappointments or disillusions or yeah, difficult, difficult situations where we feel do our prayers really matter? And I don't propose to give answers to all of those questions today. But what I do know is that God reveals all, and in him all is revealed, whether in this life or in the next. So I just want to, to share with you a bit of the experience that I so tangibly felt over this last week, and just how precious the Comforter is, the Spirit of God that so gently come and minister to us. And there is a supernatural peace as we don't mourn like the world mourns, because we mourn with hope. And there is a, is, is a peace, a peace that is really beyond understanding, that is for us who believe. A supernatural, that even though we don't know, we do know. Even if we don't understand or we cannot yet make meaning, we do know the truth deep inside. That God is a good, good father. And he holds an eternal perspective. That perhaps we will only fully know when we get to be with him. But in the meantime, the comforter comes. And he ministers to our hearts. In a beautiful way and in a language that your heart requires to be consoled and to be comforted. And in a language that your heart will understand. And this morning I want to also just quote Bill Johnson, which once said when his dad passed away, also a pastor from cancer. And he, he wrote this, he said, I don't understand everything, but I refuse to sacrifice God's goodness and love for us on the altar of human understanding. He is great beyond our understanding. But take the questions to him. He said, there is a significant reason why God called his chosen people Israel. The one, which means the one who struggles with God. For those are really his people. The ones who sometimes struggles with him. So take these questions to him and fight it out with God. Because he is a good, good father. And he will hold your hand all the way. And I echo the, those words today. And I, I say in my heart, he will show us because everything is revealed. The Bible talks about all of the things that we need answers to in the word. And the word is what prevails. The word is what preserves us and what sustains us. And when we don't know, we just come back to the word. Because it is the word that is a lamp unto our feet. 
And for some of these difficult questions in these times, we do need the eternal perspective. We need to keep the eternal perspective. For those of you that has been with us for a while, you know that we often talk about this scripture where Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 8, 22 to 23, he said, where I am going, it's not possible for you to come. He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world, of earthly order, but I am not of this world. So there are two dimensions. They are above and below. They are heaven and earth. There's the supernatural and the natural. There is the eternal and the temporary. And do we not know, as Philippians says, Philippians 3 verse 20, but we are citizens of state, a commonwealth, a homeland, which is in heaven. So when we are born again, we must know that we are in this world, but we are not from this world. And we are all en route to our homeland, which is heaven. And we live from that reality, from that perspective, because that changes everything. It is so that life is a continual process of detachment, of exchanging what is temporal for what is eternal. And this is why Paul says, if you are following today with your words, you can page with me to Philippians 1. Paul says in Philippians 1 verse 20 to 21, This is in keeping with my own eager desire and persistent expectation and hope that I shall not disgrace myself nor be put to shame in anything. We will not be put to shame in anything. But that with the utmost freedom of speech and unfailing courage, unfailing courage, now as always here too, Christ the Messiah will be magnified and get glory and praise in this body of mine and be boldly exalted in my person, whether through by life or through by death. For me, for me to live is Christ. His life is in me and to die is gain, the gain of of glory of eternity and therefore he continues you can just page over to Philippians 3 verse 10 he, co he continues to say for my determined purpose is that I may know him that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and clearly and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection which it exerts over believers and so that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness even to his death in the hope in the hope. What is this hope? This hope is that Jesus has forever overcame death at the cross. Don't we know, don't we know that the last enemy to be subdued and abolished is death? We see this in Corinthians. You can go with me. To 1 Corinthians 15. It is a wonderful chapter, and if you have time, it will be good for you to read that whole chapter. But the word says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, it says, The last enemy to be subdued and abolished is death, because in Christ there is life eternal. And we need to hold fast on that hope, because that is the simplicity but the power of the gospel which we hold so dear. And that is why he came, 
to give us salvation because he loved us and deliverance and healing and eternal life. And death is final victory. We know this. Death is final victory. And sometimes when we look from the earthly perspective, it looks like the end, but it is not the end. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse, you can just page over to verse 54 and 55. It reads, And when this perishable puts on the imperishable, and this that was capable of dying puts on freedom from death, freedom from death, then shall be fulfilled what the scripture says. Death is swallowed up, utterly vanquished forever in and unto victory. O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Listen, listen to what that same chapter says. I read for us from verse 13. It says, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is in vain. It amounts to nothing. And your faith is the vault of truth and is fruitless. Without effect, it is empty, imaginary, and unfounded. So it encourages us to remember that, the, that there is resurrection of the dead in Jesus Christ. Verse 15. We are even discovered to be misrepresenting God. For we testified of him that he has raised Christ, whom he did not raise, in case it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is a mere delusion. It's futile. It's fruitless. And you are still in your sins. Verse 19. If we who are abiding in Christ have hope only in this life, and that is all, then we are all of most people miserable and to be pitied. But the fact is, the fact is, saints, that Christ the Messiah has been raised from the dead and he became the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since it is through a man that death came to the world, also through a man that the resurrection of the dead has come for just as because of the union of nature in Adam all people died so all the virtue of the union of nature shall all in Christ be made alive and this is the hope the unshakable hope that we hold fast on to even in times that we do not understand and cannot make sense of all God doesn't ask us to figure him out or to understand all things. But it do require of us to believe and to trust in him. And this is the hope that we hold fast on to in Hebrews 6 verse 19. It says, now we have this hope as a sure and a steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip and it cannot break down under whoever steps out on it a hope that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil, where Jesus has entered in for us in advance, a forerunner, a forerunner having become a high priest forever. This hope cannot break down. It is a sure place and we can step onto that hope. It reaches far, it is certain, it is sure, it says it is a steadfast anchor to our soul. And may you also be comforted in this time. For mourning the death of a loved one or you know of someone that is mourning the death of a loved one, that we are never left by his presence. And we can hold on to this hope. 
And yes, I understand that when we say goodbye to someone, we do not mourn their death because they are alive in Christ. Yes, we mourn the void that that person is leaving in our lives. And that is why we want to hold on to someone as long as we can and make the most of the time that we have with them. I understand. And therefore, we are extremely happy when we pray and there are signs and miracles and people get healed and we rejoice in that. But also, just know that we are citizens of heaven and we are all en route to our homeland. And even though we rejoice when there's miracles and there are people that get healed, that we pray for, we, we celebrate each one of them. It is also so that we don't worship God because of the miracles and the signs. Jesus spoke about this in John 6. I want you to go there with me. John 6 verse 2. It reads, And a great crowd was following because... They had seen the signs, the miracles which he continually performed upon those who were sick. And then the chapter continues, and it was the multiplication of the, the bread and the fish. And they saw that miracle as well. But then in verse 26, Jesus said, Jesus answered them, I assure you and most solemnly tell you, you have been searching for me, not because you saw the miracles and signs, but because you were fed with the loaves and were filled and were satisfied. Because he is the bread of life. In him there is eternal life. And in him it's never the end. In John 6.35, if you turn the page, it reads, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry, and he who believes and clings to and trusts in and rely on me will never thirst at any time, at any time. And besides, where to shall we go? Where to shall we go? To who shall we go when we experience loss and pain? And when we are alone, where to shall we go? Even if we don't understand all things, even if we cannot make meaning of it all. Now in the same chapter, it also talks about that. Because Jesus was explaining to the crowd and to everybody listening there that he is the bread of life. And he said to them in verse 53, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, you cannot have any life in you unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, unless you appropriate his life and the saving merit of his blood. He who feeds on my flesh and drinks of my blood has possessed now the eternal life and I will raise him up from the dead on the last day. For my flesh is true and genuine food and my blood is true and genuine drink. He who feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood dwells continually in me and I in like manner will dwell continually in him. And this is a difficult scripture because remember this was before the cross and people didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. But for us, that looks from a, a broader perspective, the perspective after the cross, we understand the scripture and what Jesus was saying. But before, they couldn't understand what he was saying. And sometimes it just is like that depending on where you are looking at, depending from your point of view. When you received also a prophetic word, it depends on where you are looking at, from which perspective and lens. And they didn't understand what he was trying to say. 
And in verse 60, it actually says, when his disciples heard this, many of them said, said, this is hard and difficult and strange. It actually says, it is offensive and unbearable, this message. Who can stand to hear it? Who can expect to listen to such a teaching? They really didn't get it. They didn't understand it. And in verse 66, because of their lack of understanding of seeing what Jesus was trying to convey, because they didn't stand already in the fullness of the appointed time, they didn't stand already in the fullness of the perspective. It says in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples drew back and returned to their old associations and no longer accompanied him. And I want to encourage you not to leave him because you don't understand yet. You don't stand in the fullness of the appointed time yet. And Jesus then asked his, his, his disciples of his inner circle, he asked them then a question. In verse 67 it says, Jesus said to the twelve, to his disciples, he said, Will you also go away? Do you too desire to leave me? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? Because you have the words, the message of eternal life. To whom shall we go? We just fall back into the mystery of who he is because we know that he holds the words of eternal life. Life is in him. In verse 63 it says, it is the spirit who gives life. He is the life giver. The flesh conveys no benefit. There's no profit in it. But the words of true, truth that I have Speaking to you are spirit and life. So he holds the words of spirit and life. And I know, I know, we all pray for the miracles. And we should, because in him all things are possible. But we also should rest in him. This same chapter, the disciples has asked him, let me just get the verse, I think it is in verse 28. It says, they said to him, what are we to do that we may habitually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? So they were asking Jesus, how can we really do the work of God? How we can we really do the miracles and the wonders? And how can we carry out what God requires? Tell us, what do we need to do? And Jesus replied, this is the work. This is the service. This is the labor, he says, that God asks of you. That you believe in the one that he has sent. That you cleave on, trust in, rely on, and have faith in the messenger. So saints, I want to just encourage us this morning that we, we choose to believe in him. Despite of not always understanding. And that we choose to still trust in him because like Psalm 37 says, Fix your heart on the promises of God and you will dwell in the land feasting on his faithfulness. This was the message that Yeshua also brought last week. Fix your eyes on those promises. There's a different perspective. Trust in the Lord. Keep on trusting in him because you will feast on his faithfulness. It says in verse 4, Find your delight and true pleasure in your way, and he will give you what your heart desires the most. Give God the right to direct your life as you trust him along the way, and you will find that he pulled it off 
perfectly. And you will find that he pulled it off perfectly. And he will appear as your righteousness, as sure as the dawning of a new day. He will manifest as your justice, a sure and strong noonday sun. So quiet your heart in his presence and wait patiently for Yahweh. And in the meantime, as we quiet our hearts and we patiently just spend time with him, and we take all these questions to him, I just want to bless you this morning with his shalom peace, with his complete peace, a peace that is surely beyond all understanding. And I speak to your hearts and I send this word and receive it in your heart in this time of trouble, in this time of tribulation, in this time of suffering, in this time of being unsure, in this time of things that we are letting go. I speak to your heart a perfect peace from John 14 verse 27. I leave the gift of peace with you. With you, I leave the gift of peace. My peace, not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. The Amplified says, Peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives, I give unto you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Stop allowing yourself to be disturbed and do not permit yourself to be fearful and intimidated, cowardly or unsettled. I speak this peace to your heart this morning and receive it. Also the peace from Philippians 4 verse 7 that says, And God's Peace shall be yours. That tranquil state of soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort, that peace, that peace that transcends all understanding, shall garrison and mount and guard over your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Christ. So I'm going to end off for us in prayer, just blessing you with this peace. Lord, today we specifically pray for those that mourn the loss of their loved ones, of those who have passed on, Lord, to eternity. Jesus, thank you for being the forerunner. Thank you, Lord, that you have gone before us. And they have just followed, Lord. And that they are now part of the cloud of great witness, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that they are cheering us on also to run our race, Lord, with purpose and conviction and determination. And thank you, Lord, that you help us to live lives that is worthy of our calling, to live lives that makes meaning, that is significant, and that can leave a legacy of you, Lord. And that we may be found also in you. Thank you, Lord, for all your promises. Thank you, Lord, that your word says that you bless those who mourn because they shall be comforted. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, that you have left us the comforter, our help, that can comfort us in these times. And thank you for your peace that govern our hearts, that garrison our hearts and our thoughts, Lord, with a peace that only you can give. And thank you, Lord, for hope and that you are our hope and that you are our confidence. And thank you, Lord, that we can just fall back into you. But we choose today to hold fast onto that unshakable hope and that we believe in the one that holds the words of eternal life. Because who, where, where will we go, Lord? No, we believe in you we trust in you because you hold 
the words of life. Your, your words are spirit and your words are life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us in our distress. Thank you. Thank you that you turn beauty from ashes. Thank you, Lord, that every death there is a resurrection. And in every end there is a new beginning. And thank you that winter holds the promise of summer. And with every full moon setting, there is a full sun rising over us. And thank you, Lord, that in you it's never the end. Because you are our hope of glory. And now to you that is able to do exceedingly more, abundantly more than what we could ever think or dream or desire, Lord. To you be the glory forever and ever. Thank you, Lord, that this morning we can send this word. We can send your peace. Because peace is a name. You are the Prince of Peace. And today we just fall back into you. Trust in you. Rely on you. And take confidence in you. We honor you. Amen. Amen. It is also today our communion sermon. And I want to encourage you to as a family or there where you are alone in your house, spend time with the Lord. Have communion with him. Partake in the communion because the communion is really to remember what he did at the cross. His finished work at the cross. And the word says, do it as often so that you can remember and have fellowship, that sweet fellowship and communion with him. And as you have communion, let this verse echo in your spirit. John 6 verse 35 that says, Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry and he who believes in and cleans to and trust in and rely on me will never thirst anymore at any time. God bless you. God keep you. His peace is with you. Amen and amen.